it's, it's per usual. The, uh, uh, we learn to, we're learning to fly the plane while the plane is in motion. That's, that's, better that's, that's how we do it here. <laughs> when do we get this Hitler haircut? <laughs> Hitler haircut? Okay. It's making me feel ill. Are we live? We're live. We are live. Hi, everyone. We're just uh, figuring things out here. I'm not sure if I'm in the shot or not. Let's see. What? Uh oh. Okay. Squeeze in. I got room we over like here. Each other. There. Okay. Cool. Um, the only problem here, Nancy, is that I'm lit a lot and you're not lit enough. So let's switch positions. No. Unless, really? Yeah, that's good. Well, but I mean, like, um, I think it'll look nicer. It'll look ladier. He does. Right. <laughs> ladier. 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 <laughs> We like to look ladier here. I like, I like to look yeah. ladyest. Yeah. Ladyest. You are the ladyest. <laughs> I'm ladier, and Matt is no lady. See, come on. Hey, the hey, world, hey. The world prefers that. That's much better. That's right, for okay. sure. Hi, everyone. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us here on a, is it Thursday? Who the hell knows what, does, no do you, idea. nobody knows what day it's it is. It's Omicron about. day. I, I, it's Omicron. It's Omicron. It's March That's 9th, right. 2020. That's it. Oh yeah. We've been talking about right? it. Yeah. Over, yeah. Over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now this is way too freaking bright. Oh my God. No, I'm you're fine. Ghost. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Carol, I'm going to just Hi. touch you a lot because we're you. not going to be able to touch me. This fluffiness. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Oh, <laughs> So, Carol, um, first of all, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, we've been trying to get Carol in the studio here for about a year because both Carol and Matt very, very, very early started to call bullshit on what was going on in the public schools because they both have children, five uh, in total. In Is that right? Yeah, five in Between total. Us, yeah, uh, um, yeah uh, kids in the majority. School. And, um, I mean, you started writing about this in the fall of 2019. Yeah, sort of before the pandemic was talking about the uh, rise in kind of equity politics and changing of admissions. We're in the same district. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is District 15 in Brooklyn. You don't have any kids in that district. I left. do. Oh, you still? Oh, well, okay. I mean, my sons go there. Okay. Um, yeah, my daughter's not. Um, yeah, so... Uh, there are the district 15 was one of the first in the uh, city to do a pretty radical overhaul of the way that it does handles admissions. And it did in the name of desegregation and equity uh, in the names of the people who did it or the words of the people who did it. And, uh, and the process and some of the, the outcomes of that were um, I think uh, beneficial, like it, 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 uh, it encouraged people, kids who had not applied to, good schools in the district to do so and, and get in. So that was a good part about it. Other parts about it, especially the process was awful. Well, you know, whenever they asked parents what they, what they wanted, whatever the parents said the most they didn't want is what they did. And then they portrayed it as this uh, democratic process. So anyways, I would, had been writing and boring people about this. Then the pandemic hits and everyone sees not just that, but pandemic response, which in New York, and again, we're recording this on, on Thursday, December 16th. And this is the last time any of us are going to see people again in New York yeah, City. Yeah, for a while. I mean, we'll go to the Reason Party later on today. And, and then that's, that's that's about it. It's sort of like night. March 9th, 2020 all over again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so Matt started writing about that. Then, you know, you had COVID come around and basically you guys were among, because as as I used this quote yesterday with uh, Ethan Strauss, New York couldn't find its ass with both hands when it came to COVID. And you guys are like, shut the goddamn schools. Like, let us figure this out. And that was like a little unpopular because, oh, I don't know, for whatever reasons they claimed that was not the right thing to do. Maybe, oh, because some kids couldn't stay home because they didn't have a home to go to. De Blasio was at that time using schools to provide services. He right, saw them right. as, as mm -hmm. a way to solve hunger. So it was like the last thing to close at the time. This yeah. is before we knew much about sure. COVID. Right. Within three months, we knew a lot more right. about right. COVID. Right. A month later, we knew a lot yeah. more. And so yeah. then you guys were both like, okay, let's open the school. So I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Just a long way of saying, we've been trying to get Carol in here, but everybody's been busy and traveling and she was in Florida for a lot of last year. But now, now... We're not going to be able to get you in the studio for a little I'll while. She's a quitter. I'll be back. I will come straight to Columbia. Come here. We've got a bed here. You can awesome. you can sleep on that bed that yeah. folds out. It's almost as nice as your whole entire house in in Park Slope. But um, but uh, we want to just talk about uh, yeah. you can talk about whatever in the schools and also why you're leaving. Yeah, I love that. Well, why are you leaving, quitter? Well, because it sucks. Because this is the last time we're all hanging out, right? And we know it. The thing is, on the way here, um, my all my messages are like, have you heard anything? Are the schools closing? Like, what's happening? My my school has sent me this. Make sure you have a device email. What does this mean? My um, A friend of mine 
messaged me that her school, they were having like assessments next week. They moved them up to tomorrow. Like, what does that mean? Um, and the thing is that I can't answer definitively. They will definitely not close schools, right? But in Florida, if you ask me tomorrow, Florida has a massive outbreak. Are they closing schools? I can tell you definitively they are not closing schools. Yeah. And that mean, goes a long way. Florida had a massive outbreak when in the summer. In the summer, um, yeah. And now Florida and the South, all of which had uh, uh, the worst outbreaks in the country in the summer, um, have the lowest amounts um, because it turns out that this virus has seasonal and, and regional. Who knew except everyone? Characteristics. <laughs> I, just, I don't understand. <laughs> like, you know, I, I tweeted this. I mean, I've, I've been tweeting like, it's obviously, we're heading into a spike. We're heading into a spike. I kept looking at the numbers and they're like, are they're identical to last year, like literally like identical. Um, and I kept saying like, we're going to get into this in December, January when it gets a little colder. And actually our weather has been unseasonably warm. warm. Yeah. So we've actually been able to, I think, put this off for as long as possible. Um, and now it's here and it's happening. And it's, I don't even believe it's Omicron, honestly. Like I, you know, it just seems like a little fast for this to be the Omicron variant, but you know, who knows? I think um, it's been going on. I mean, we're, we're, we don't even play epidemiologists here, but uh, Omicron is only now starting to become detected, but the wave um, has been four to six weeks, just yeah. kind of climbing and climbing right. and climbing and everywhere. Like the, the Northeast right now is by far the uh, highest vaccinated uh, part of the country and the one with the most coronavirus cases. Right. And I wish people would put those, two together, not as a way to say, oh, vaccines don't work, but the opposite. Right. Like, it's so great to have vaccines because you don't die. None of those states are in the top 20 of deaths in the last 14 days, um, but they're all in the top 20 for uh, cases. And yeah, it's it's seasonal and it's actually the same. And you say it's the, the it's the certainty you don't know if what's going to happen with the schools. This is why ultimately we pulled uh, our first grade daughter out of public schools. My wife and I, um, who's French, and and I have never been to uh, and never wanted to go to a private school mm -hmm. in either of mm -hmm. our lives. And we did not want that for our kids. We want them to go to public school. And I can hear all you libertarians out there cussing at me, and that's fine. You know, I have my life and you have yours. Um, and uh, But we pulled her up because of the uncertainty. Like at that time, it was okay. Um, it looked like the case rates and things like that in the fall in, in New York. But you knew this was going to happen again. Right. And you could not depend at all on, on schools being reliably open. And we could depend on the private schools being more reliably That's open. It. That's, That's it. it. The reliability is everything. With kids, it's so tough to not know what's going to happen. And Especially so, when you have like 17 kids right, like you do. Right, when I have 17 of them, right. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the, the thing, I, I, and I know you pointed to this too, but in May 2020, when de Blasio was asked, you know, will schools reopen in September? And he was like, that's like so far away. Who knows what happens in September? That was the moment I knew schools would not reopen because nothing happens quickly. And parents know you can't in May not know where your kids are going to school. And so, of course, over that summer, I had tons of people, tons of friends move away or, you know, temporarily or forever. Right. Um, and they were making plans for their kids because nobody wakes up August 30th like, hey, where are my kids going to school this year? Yeah. Um, it's, it's something that parents need to plan for. And there's a um, uh, I was I've been predicting since uh, at least April of this year when the first preliminary uh, application numbers for kindergarten for this year came in for New York City and they were really far down, right? This is supposed to be the year of public school bounce back. <laughs> and um, and what I had said, and, and you know, Carol's actual life will kind of confirm this. So this happens in the spring and March of 2020. It happens in the whole country, New York, the, the heaviest, but everyone shuts down schools. Um, everyone like then scrambles in the summer, try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. In New York's case, there was you know, you couldn't go to school, but you could go to a daycare inside of a school and right. be and be supervised by city employees. It was very, very curious. Um, but then so the fall happens and that in that whole year is uh, depending on where you live very much. So uh, if you live in Florida, you're in school full time. If you live in New York, de Blasio capriciously um, said, OK, the school year is going to start on this day. No, it's going to be on this day. And then in this day, he set a, ri a ridiculous and like scientifically unmoored uh, uh, like uh, rationale for when schools would close. If there's a community spread of 3% around the school, even though we were testing whoa, in schools whoa, whoa. at the time. 3% community. It was 3% testing, which was like the worst possible metric ever. If it was 3% community, like, I don't know, that kind of maybe makes some sense, but 3% of, of tests 
came back positive, that meant schools closed. Right. That means we counted on 97 healthy people to get tested every day for every hundred. Um, right. And, and as soon as 96 got tested, schools were closed. And then he reversed that decision for elementary schools 10 days later, but then kept it for middle schools for the next four months. Like n- <laughs> none of it made sense. And so, every, you know, we in our family, we organized a pod with three other families and that pod would be there to absorb it whenever the school would just close for 10 days mm-hmm. at, at, uh, at very short notice. Um, but uh, to get to the point of uh, enrollment numbers of this fall. So that was like the, it was the original end of one school year that was messed. The next year was was riddled with insur- uncertainty, especially if you lived in a Democratic run state or city. It takes a while for parents, especially when you're a damn immigrant, you got a bunch of kids or <laughs> uh, and uh, to make plans. So this is the fall where people made plans. And what happened? What do we find out from NPR? Did a huge uh, a study of 600, I think, school districts in 23 states um, of this fall enrollment numbers. And of course, they cast it as a very negative thing of like, oh, the bounce back didn't happen. Right. In most of these places, and especially all of the big city school districts, enrollment went down another year. And now we're way down from two years ago. People were, you know, criticizing us for saying, you don't understand, this is an inflection point in mm-hmm. public education in this country. Um, it kind of is, right? Yeah, Ter- Terry is. McAuliffe yeah. didn't get that message. Either. No. Right. You know? And I still don't think that they, you know, that politicians have really absorbed it. I feel like, especially in New York, I think so many of our politicians just don't have school age kids, uh, that they really don't get how insanely hard this is. And, you know, one of the things that I, I've been saying is, you know, my kids being home was one of the highlights of the pandemic for me. It was, it was like a really sweet time when they were home, but it was hurting them. And I, as a parent, even though it was nice to have my kids like cozy with me cuddling on the couch, I know they need to be in school. So I have to do what's best for them. And what's best for them right now is getting them the hell out of New York city. Yeah. Um, the, the, all kinds of things are you, you learn, um, or my, uh, uh, youngest, um, again, who's six, like, when you cut off a five-year-old from uh, other human beings of kids their age for two months, they become uh, feral. Yeah, they're they're unrecognizable. It is yeah. so heartbreaking to see what happens to them. What did she say to you? I don't feel like I'm a human being. Yeah, she would say things like that. Um, uh, and, <laughs> and she's that's that's not the type. She's a very yeah. sunny personality, yeah. uh, generally speaking. Weird, but. Uh, very, uh, very sunny. Uh, and she would say those, those crazy things. So how your, your, your kids are all well adjusted and fine, or did at least one of them turn out weird? Um, well, they're all weird, but yeah. in, in their own unique ways, um, they're, they're, you know, they're doing okay. They were definitely getting a little odd during the pandemic. They had each, you know, when everybody was home, they had each other, which, you know, was good. Um, and, you know, we tried to do things as normal as possible. We spent four and a half months in Florida last year for this very <coughs> reason because we wanted them to go to school. And it was it's all been kind of aimed at my youngest because my oldest two are like just older and well adjusted and already kind of on the way, you know, with, as far as schooling is concerned. Whereas my younger one, he's not reading yet. And I, I, I just see that he's suffering, um, just not understanding what his teacher is saying through the mask. And uh, he's not like responding correctly through his mask. And he's not repeating himself when he when she when he's not understood. And all of this is snowballing. Um, And actually, there was a study where my son's in first grade, um, and it's first graders, this is the reading year, and they are in mass across the country. really falling off the grid in terms of where they should be. And so many well, kids yeah. are not going to recover. Like I got, you know, right now my son is with a tutor. Um, you know, we're going to obviously take it seriously and get him help, but there's so many kids that that's just not going to work out. And he's got older siblings that yeah. can also bring him along, but some kids won't. Yeah. They just recover. literally won't, you know, you just fall a little further yeah. behind. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, when he wasn't reading in kindergarten, it was like, you know, he'll read before he gets to college. And then you read <laughs> these studies and like some kids really won't read before they get to college. Like they literally, won't go to they, it will never pick up for them it'll never happen well you remember how in school when you didn't know something and you just kind of like shrank back and didn't like the math you just like tried to be invisible well i don't know what you're talking yeah, about Matt, yeah. like, when did i not know something <laughs> <laughs> um by the way I, since i can't see that people are asking questions in orange that means and, and paying for it so that they they get their questions answered or read. So I'll read a few someone old, with few eyes old, can be you yeah, vandals. Yeah. <laughs> so you just drop some 25 coins. He says, Matt, I like the Buddy Holly uh, outfit, but the hair is all wrong. I agree with you. <laughs> I went to get a haircut today. Uh, I figured there'd be some cancellations um, and they didn't have any right at the moment. I was going to, uh, I was going to set that up. So you're right. Um, and I'm responding to the community and thanks for the, uh, 
Paige. <laughs> Thank that's you. Pretty, he, that's pretty he's great. always our, our best, our, our best customer. <laughs> um, the but the learning loss thing, it's going to be fascinating to watch too, because um there's going to be a concerted effort in places where teachers union have the most strength, which again tends to be in democratic run areas, um, to not measure that. I yeah, mean, uh, right, right. Well, because we were speaking about this on Ethan Strauss's great House of Strauss podcast last night, people have built themselves platforms based on whatever information they misinterpreted in order to give themselves power. Well, they're not going to back down now. Right. It's like, oh, I have to give all this stuff back because uh, the science or whatever is going to disprove it. Well, no, but what's going to happen? The parents are going to, you can, you can keep thinking that it's true all you want. But if people keep dipping, then your platform that you've built with erroneous information is not even going to do you any good because yeah. you're not going to have, I mean, what did you say? How, how much money did they lose at that one particular school because they lost oh, yeah. 8% or whatever it was? Because yeah, we have per student funding yeah. in a lot of places, so, including that was a, a place right in your neighborhood, yeah, right? Yeah, well, that was where my kids originally went to school. Um, that was our first school. And then we moved in the neighborhood and we, they switched schools. But um, that school was really small and it was really... Uh, very popular and then the pandemic hit and all these people like you know left for all different reasons i mean when you started uh when we started this conversation off about the changes in the school system uh in district 15 i have friends who left because of those changes mm -hmm. because their straight a student uh, child it, because it's random got into some school far away they don't even know and that's not yep. highly regarded and um, they weren't going to wait around and see how that turned out, that she had to travel an hour to get to whatever the school is, and then it might not even be good. And they were like, bye. You know? Yeah, the, the uh, we live in a, a place that uh, had spent the previous 10 to 15 years gentrifying pretty rapidly, Brownstone, Brooklyn. And um, like a lot of gentrifying places, uh, the school percentage, the, up, the enrollment increased and the uptake, uh, so the percentage of people sending their kids to public schools. And Michael Bloomberg... Um, not someone who I usually say positive things about. Uh, he recognized that um, having families with kids uh, stay in a place and value the schools was is healthy for a city, yeah. um, regardless of what one thinks about public education in general. Um, so it went up, went up, went up, went up, went up. They changed the admissions system right as the middle school admissions system right as our oldest was going to middle school in the same district. Um, and after going up un uninterrupted, I think for 10 years, it went down enrollment by 7% the next year. That's a big number as a, an entire uh, district. Um, and then individual yeah. schools with the pandemic. I mean, it's not going to, it's Randy Weingarten, the, uh, the uh, uh, president of the American Federation of Teachers, um, who people like Carol and I um, all have up on a dartboard in our basement. <laughs> um, uh, no, she. I think she's been one of the biggest villains in uh, during this pandemic, yeah. um, not just working with unions to keep schools closed, but pretending the opposite right. again and again. Yeah. And uh, the way I liken to it is it's like they're, um, what are they, sort of the corporate raider type of, of people who who buy an asset, uh, buy a company, like strip down the assets and get one last payday before they leave. Yeah. Um, there was one last huge payday from the federal government in the tune of of $200 billion, of which 120 uh, odd billion went to Public, that's that's three times as much they spent on a given year for K through 12. Um, they got this big COVID a lump sum payout um, of which most of which is spent on personnel. But at the at that time, um, they engaged in policies that drove people away from public schools. So there's just not going to be those jobs. Absolutely not. And and with Randy Weingarten, she helped rewrite CDC policy that kept schools closed. I think right. that's such a, a thing that I will never forget. And every time her name is mentioned, I'm going to be mentioning that for the rest of her life. Um, because she literally was instrumental in keeping these kids in, in keeping these kids at home and keeping them keeping their schools closed. Yeah. So the way that worked was Rochelle Walensky, the head of the CDC, who's an epidemiologist and was at Harvard, I think. Um, in the summer of 2020, she was asked by a city in Massachusetts or a district, um, "What do you think about distancing? Right? Should uh, you know kids be distanced? I think it was six foot feet was the mm -hmm. standard." And and, uh, and she's like, "Well, it can be less than that um, if that means." by hitting that uh, standard, you're going to keep schools only open half time. It's important to keep kids in those settings because those settings are safe compared right. to the rest of everything because kids don't catch it and spread it as much as other people. Mm -hmm. um, that's what she said as a private citizen. She becomes head of the CDC. They do their first big science-based study coming out in February. And at the last minute, she keeps that original six-foot um, uh, standard in there, which effectively means that 90% or, or so of the country, if they all followed the CDC's 
uh, requirements would have school open just half time, which is basically what New York did uh, in the last okay. school year. Um, and we have seen because there's been uh, uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. She was there. I mean, Randy Weingarten yeah. and the uh, uh, head of the other big teachers union were in the White House on day two of this administration talking to a National Education Association member, Jill Biden, Dr. Jill. Um, and they were in a lot of these meetings and pushing directly on that thing. When they heard that that the CDC might soften that, they they applied pressure. So the CDC came out yeah. with those recommendations. Everyone who actually is an epidemiologist said, what the hell are you doing? Right. No other country was doing this. Um, and a month later or so, they had to uh, backtrack on this. Right. But it's, uh, you know, that, and as I think the White House at one point uh, defended this by saying, well, you know, we're just have, inviting all the stakeholders to be part of right. the science. It's like, stakeholder mm -hmm. science? <laughs> is that what we're doing now? Right. And, and of course, the what I also like to say is that their solution, their hybrid model, turns out to be the worst one for the spread of COVID because kids are in school, you know, two days a week. And then where are they the other three days, like dispersed around the city with caregivers, like in pods, I mean, just all over. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that the hybrid model was literally worse than a full-time schooling model. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's not uh, the kind of thing that people are going to forget. I want to ask you about mm -hmm. an aspect of this that you've written. I thought, cruelly at times. Uh, you've uh, spoken about the pajama class of people, um, who basically like me, who like me. can, and, and, me. and all yeah, of us, yeah. who can who can work at home in our pajamas because we're working in like knowledge class or whatever. And a lot of the pajama class, especially those who don't have kids, um, are happy to stay at home and recommend that we do sort of maximalist restrictions out there and they order their things from Amazon. Um, and they don't really worry about um, people who have to work for a living who in New York are immigrants largely. Right. Um, uh, talk a little bit about that and how you think that played out in schools and how that even maybe affected your decision to get out of here. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of the main things for me was that the pajama class has a lot of power. And so I don't understand why they don't just take it up with their bosses and say, look, I've been working from home. I've been doing a great job for the last, you know, almost two years. I want to stay home. Instead, they need society to shut down to make that acceptable. Like, I, I just don't understand why. But, you know, one of the things is, obviously, um, I believe in school choice. I'm sure you both do as well. And the pajama class, in, in a lot of cases, pulled their kids out of public schools and put them either in private or I, I know plenty of people that moved to like their winter house or their summer house and enrolled them in schools in Connecticut or Long Island or wherever. Um, um, or moved, you know, to, with family in, in other states, in Florida and Texas, and where, where schools were open, but never agitated for school choice, never agitated for their neighbors who don't have those options to do the same. Uh, so that's really been one thing that has driven me just bananas during this whole time, because I... I don't understand how you can save your own kids and never try to save anybody else's. And I, I feel like one of the things about leaving with my family is I feel really terrible about all the kids I'm leaving behind that I feel like I've been agitating for and fighting for for these years. And now I just I have to focus on my own kids. And it, it's hard. But you know, what you mentioned about immigrants, I'm from a very immigrant community in Brooklyn. Um, so last year, when there was a, with a spike right around now, um, at first, they were painting it as like the Trump area spikes, like these areas voted for Trump. And I would be like, yeah, those areas are also the super immigrant, like work every day, don't sit on their couch areas. Like, you, yes, you, you've you identified this one like thing where they're, you know, right of center, um, but they're also the ones who are like delivering your groceries and, you know, driving the Amazon trucks and uh, keeping their small business open and running their fruit stand and the, the rest of it. Um, and it just the discarding of those people is so crazy to me that and, and it's like by the, the class that like pretends that they care about equity and they don't care about equity. They just um, want what they want and they don't care who is sidelined. They're not they're not seeing it. I had to take I don't remember why, but I had to take a, a subway at like 530 in the morning, late summer 2020. I had to go somewhere to the airport someplace. And this is when, like, no one's like, oh, my God, we're not on the subways. Those subways are closed. That subway was packed. Right. You know what it was packed <laughs> with? It was people going to work. Yeah. You know? And it's like, but they weren't the pajama class people. They were people wearing, you know, green, whatever, dusty clothes going to work yeah. at 530 in the morning. So, you know, everything keeps rolling here, whether you want to, you know, 
say that it it shouldn't be because we have to protect whatever our position is or not. Right. The uh, the equity arguments used by um, teachers and teachers unions, especially, I, I will say unions more than teachers. Uh, it's a hell of a job, a hard job to take. And a lot of the teachers I know who are in unions have not been happy with what the unions have done. So right. it's important to make that distinction. And then they're held hostage. It's just, it's terrible. Yeah. It's criminal. Sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but the unions themselves in places like Chicago, in uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and elsewhere uh, in New Jersey and uh, over in Montclair, um, when parents would, you know, annoying people like Carol would say, open your damn schools. It's ridiculous. They should be open. They would say, well, you know, in, in New York Times, Eliza Shapiro, uh, their education reporter, who's not a huge favorite among the school reopening crowd, would always characterize them as white parents right. um, uh, at every step. And so they would use kind of equity and saying, you know, these, these white people uh, are, are doing this. They don't understand mm -hmm. that, that this, uh, the, the virus uh, disproportionately impacts minority communities. Actually, yes, we do understand that. Right. And the school opening is part of that. It is remarkable how much the distribution of whether your school is open or closed depends on your race and socioeconomic status. Uh, people of color and people who are more poor were much more remote. And what we've learned without a shadow of a doubt, anyone who's looked at this is remote learning has been terrible. Atrocious. The amount of learning loss, the amount of, of psychological and social problems associated with it um, is, is remarkable. And it hit those communities hardest. And to come and hear a defense to keep places closed in the name of mm -hmm. equity was infuriating. And I think it's why people kind of look at me weird when they see me because they think that I'm mad all the time. <laughs> I am mad all the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, the other thing is that leadership matters. And it's, you know, um, when you have leadership of a city or a state saying schools are dangerous, people are going to internalize that. They're going to they're going to really they're going to believe it. Um, and I, I talk a lot about the fact that, you know, part of the movement of Florida is not just for Governor DeSantis, um, but he kind of did set the path that people in Florida believe schools are safe. And so they send their kids to school. And I've met plenty of Democrats, plenty of leftists there who believe this, who believe that because he sort of led the way. When you had politicians in New York saying like schools are dangerous and we don't know if we're going to open them. Super spreader events was yeah. the phrase that yeah. Andrew Cuomo used this summer. Yeah. This summer. Right. Like they're going to be, we, they We've seen what happens. Yeah, they it's they're not super spreaders. Yeah. Like the, the amount of of willful ignorance of what happens when you open schools and daycare facilities everywhere. You think we wouldn't be hearing about every single time schools were super spreader right. events? Exactly, they, that gets covered. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. So, a question about your family. You have three children. They are what eleven, nine, and 11, six. Eleven, eight, and six. Yeah. Okay, how do they? I mean, how do they feel about moving? So they were really not excited about it for a while. Um, they have their own, you know, their lives here. My six-year-old is, is good to go. Um, but my 11 and my eight, you know, they have really close friends. They have um, they have relationships and they don't want to necessarily leave. Uh, but their grandparents are here? Here, yeah. yeah. Um, and like my mom is in our house every single day. Our, my in-laws are a big part of our lives. Um, my brother and his family, they live near you in Carroll Gardens. Um, and... Uh, it, it, it's it's really tough, but they get that we're doing it for them. They really do. It's like, um, and I, I keep I keep telling them, just imagine, like on January fifth when school starts again in Florida, you're gonna walk into school not wearing a mask. Mm. Like, how bananas is that gonna be for you? Like, it's it's just like they, my six year old has never been in school without a mask ever. And I remember last year uh, when you were down there, you're like, yeah, they're they're playing outside. They're on their bikes. They're on the streets. Right. They're just playing. Yeah. And that's what children kind of like are good at and want to do yeah they're well, not being mired in the in other people's politics that yeah. really don't have their best interests right so the other thing is that like i you know we try to it, it's also like a suburbs versus city thing because i've never lived in the suburbs so this might be a disaster yep. <laughs> like, we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but a question do you have a guest but, room for us and uh, we can help yeah, you yeah. Have, like a 17 bedroom house <laughs> 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 i'm sure we'll be there yeah um paloma I, you know, south it'll, it'll be interesting um but uh but it, the thing is that we we in brooklyn we try to give you know my 11 year old daughter a lot of freedom but there's not she has a few friends that whose parents are sane and like let them yep. like you know go play outside and not be masked and etc but most of her friends are still like not quite 
into hanging out, um, first of all, maskless, but, you know, they're not really given the kind of freedom that I think they should be given. And, and so if the suburbs, if she meets friends who are her age, that they can go play and be themselves and be free, maybe that'll be worth like the, yeah. you know, the, the trade-offs for us. So. Have you seen the commercial from New York City about um, <sighs> let teens be teens again? Um, or the oh show. Oh my God! Yeah. You want to talk about oh, it? Horrible. Cause... Um, so it's just it's it's saying they have to get vaccinated in order to be able to like go to the yeah. movies or play sports. Or yeah, they, it shows it shows a sad teen in the bleachers while the friends are having fun and playing football, and then and then look at these girls and they're just like eating pizza and watching movies and they have masks right. on, but they love it. Uh, <laughs> and then then sad girls over there, and it's like don't let your teen be sad. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Tough. I mean, I haven't vaccinated uh, our kids, so they can't go eat at any restaurants or go to any museums or anything like that yet. Um, you haven't vaccinated your kids? No. Why not? Um, I just don't think they need it. And the thing is, my 11 year old, we were kind you know, we probably will sooner than my eight and five or my six. He just turned six. So sorry. Um, but, you know, I just don't think it's necessary. And so many countries around the world are probably not going to do it. Um, I mean, I know Finland's announced that they're not, but I, I, I don't even see Britain doing it yet, um, on, vaccinating under 11. So I kind of want to see what happens. I'm really in no rush. And I feel like if I'm, I'm just not going to get pressured into it by Bill de Blasio, is, you know. That's so, a, that's always a good policy. How much of it is the it's the pressure that you're rebelling against, and how much of it is uh, your own kind of assessment of yeah. the science of it? So I'm not concerned about the science. I'm not worried something's going to happen. I'm really not. Um, I, I I'm not one of like I'm just I I, I have a lot of uh, problems with our, our health policies, uh, but I'm not. I, my background is in the legal department of pharmaceutical companies, so I I'm not like oh big pharma's trying to like poison my kids like not at all. Um, I just have seen data that shows that kids are not susceptible to this. So I don't understand why I would introduce a vaccine that we know quite little about. And I got vaccinated as soon as I could. I'm old. I'm not in the best shape. Like I, you know, I have to do what I have to do, but my kids, um, just don't need it. And so, um, it, it just, I hate being pressured into like getting a vaccine that they don't need for like going to the movies or something and I, I think right it's now ridiculous. right now the um of that age cohort of under 12 uh in new york city 22 percent are um fully vaccinated including our six-year-old um but it's 22 percent um and as yeah. i you know if you think about um miracle on 34th street the movie with like little natalie wood being all cute um she wouldn't happen she wouldn't meet chris kringle because um she wouldn't really allowed to go to macy's <laughs> But you know what? Uh, in, she wouldn't. They no. just be like, no. "Hey, hey, Natalie, where? Show me the little." Wait, can you not go to Macy's? You can't go into a store. You can go into a store. No, you cannot. No, now you can't. You can't unless unless the um. Oh, you'd have to be masked. You have to, you have to be oh, masked. masked, right? Yeah. Right. Um, the the store itself has to <coughs> has to either enforce a vaccine mandate or ensure that everybody is masked at all at all places. Right. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so they, right. But I, you know, when it's in perfect Mayor de Blasio fashion, there's no exceptions, right? So um, the day it was announced, this like guy from Britain uh, comments on Twitter and he's like, um, the vac I'm bringing my kids to New York next week and the vaccine is not authorized yet here for under 11. Like, can I, can I really not take them to like Broadway or like restaurants and whatever? But like no consideration for the fact that like, Basically, very few countries have authorized this for under 11. And His response was like, well, that's great. We can, we'll incentivize them to do it. <laughs> like, yeah, while you're on vacation, you get vaccinated. Like, who does that? Um, so it, it just, it's crazy because the lack of exceptions means that, you know, tourists from much of the world can't come to the U.S. with their kids because they can't dine indoors. Or but that's fine because the New York City economy is doing super great. Yeah, no, that's right. You're rocking. you're cutting off your nose to spite your face, right? Mm -hmm. You're just gonna you're just gonna stand on that bedrock policy that you believe in and for what? And and yeah. everybody else can just fall the fuck apart. Right. And the mandate that hit when he uh, announced the mandates in October for grown-ups and for kids over 12. Um, I mean we're in a spike right now. How much good did that mandate do? What what is that for? Um, I mean, if, if we're still having like 
it's to prevent cases. the best face on it is that it prevents serious illness, right? For so the individual, though. For the but individual. I, how is a public health policy I if, mean, if we're still having a spike? Kathy Hochul, the governor of, of New York, uh, on Tuesday, she was mad because uh, she is the one who came with the uh, business that have to uh, show uh, uh, proof of vaccine uh, for everybody or, uh, or mask up everyone over the age of two. And about one quarter of the counties in the New York uh, said, no, nah, we won't be enforcing that because they're a, a head of enforcement. Turns out they're all Republicans, um, uh, um, surprisingly. Um, uh, and she was mad. And she said, you know, this basically this uh, 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 surge would not have happened. It's uh, except for the unvaccinated. It's a surge of the unvaccinated. And like Middlebury College, Vermont, yeah, had an outbreak of 50 cases. Uh, on a campus in which 99% are vaccinated, 99%, you know, right. like uh, the NBA right now is having a bunch of cases. Those guys, for the most part, they're supposed to be uh, vaccinated. Like it's, yeah. it's happening. They're not right. getting super sick, thankfully, but um, there is a, a surge of this happening and into and the instinct to always blame it, literally call it, you know, a uh, 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 pandemic of the unvaccinated at all times. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it's a mindset of punishment and like, what can we do to punish these people into right. compliance? Right. But it's also not necessarily accurate. And also death is kind of a punishment. Yeah. It's a, you know, yeah. if, if you really want to get your, your just desserts on people who are unvaccinated. And, and again, I think that everyone should get vaccinated. Um, uh, but, uh, like to have that idea that I want to punish, blame them for me getting it, yeah. um, is, uh, it's kind of a sick mindset. Well, we, we had a friend, uh, that we had lunch with, I think it was a week ago today. He was vaccinated, double vaccinated COVID. And got sick too. And got sick. But uh, he's a derelict. So. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but we, uh, we were talking last night. Um, it's like, everyone's going to get it. Everyone's going to get Every, it. We're all going to get it. I actually have just a normal old fashioned cold right now. Are we going to get it in this room? Right yeah, now? right now. So. Well, well, I, <laughs> Again, my, this is March 2020. Yeah. But it's like, you know, do you go to the, you know, we're all going to get it. That's inevitable. But do we go to like the 17 parties that we have invitations I'm for? for the, the 17 next, parties. Are, are you? Yeah. yeah I'm I, I'm I think I, I yeah, you're it. just, you're going That's out in a blaze of glory. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, look, I'm vaccinated. What was it for? If not to go to the 17 parties? Yeah. Like, well, yeah. I, like what, the, during flu season, we're not like, well, I don't know about all these parties. Like people might be coughing there. Like it, we have to get over it. That's it. I was thinking something earlier when we, we started the conversation, you know, we all went to grade school and you know remember when everybody got sick everybody got sick at yeah, the same time got sick. that was it did they close the schools no whenever it had chicken pox did they right. close the no, schools they put, us together they put you us together <laughs> they're like get in there with your brother you know it's like right. so you're not going to go to the 17 parties i'm uh i just have uh this is in the last 24 hours uh just weird kind of sense of foreboding and doom that reminds me so much of that uh, March 9th week, yeah. week last yeah. uh, in 2020, yep. Yep. because right, what what happened? What did we do on that March 9th? Um, and we slobbered all over each other in a bar. Um, with there, yeah, there's a fifth column, Party <laughs> yeah. <rock. laughs> but it was uh, even before that. So we recorded a fifth column podcast with Rouse at uh, uh, Douth Hat, I can't pronounce the name ever. Um, and uh, and then he soon afterwards uh, thought that he contracted COVID. So like we're in a small room like this, mm -hmm. yelling at each other about like national conservatism <laughs> or some crap or pornography. Actually, we're talking about pornography. Um, that was that in the afternoon, a rare afternoon taping of the fifth column. Uh, then we went to a Soho forum debate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it was like libertarians mad at each other about something. Shocking. Um, and we know at least one a person who caught it there. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, we went to a fifth column, uh, uh, get drunk, uh, slobber on each Small. other. Sounds after, amazing. After it was, part of this, it was great. this was this was March 9th. And by March 12th of that week, that's when the entire world closed down. Yeah. That's when so the why, NBA. Right. So why would you skip anything now? That sounds awesome. It was totally awesome. And we uh, and I, I still kind of think that we all gave each other COVID back then because that we didn't have tests really. Right, right. Um, and that we got it and didn't get all of that sick. Um, uh, Michael like actually got sick and thought he had it. And then you and I also had like the mystery pre-COVID that could have been. Remember that guy said oh, to that's you? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, in November. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're right. Maybe I'll go to all yeah, the parties. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the no, party. I, but I, I don't. But I don't we, want we to. We canceled a. We, uh, 
I have a group of friends and every year we do this thing where we go to a, an old school Italian restaurant and we were supposed to go like whatever that was, March 11th or something. Everything had not shut down yet. That Saturday night that everything was still popping, but we canceled. And I swear I spent like two years, you know, being Ruined mad about that. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we only just did it like three weeks ago. We went to Porlini's. Um, oh, yeah. 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 It was great. Yeah. Like, but, uh, you know, but it was like, I, I kept look, thinking back to it, like, why did we cancel that dinner? Like, what a ridiculous thing to do. We should have waited till they shut us down to cancel. For stuff. me, it's uh, like, I'm not worried at all about getting sick. I presume I'll get the Omicron at some point and it'll be fine. It won't matter. I just don't want to inconvenience my family and yeah. have my kids get quarantined and that kind of stuff. But school, you know, school's almost on break. Now's a great time to <laughs> now. Now the time is the time to get it. Right, right. Yeah. My mom is boosted. I mean, that's really it. It's for, it was for my mom and my in laws. They're all boosted. Like I, you know, and they're all living. They're all living and enjoying life. And I think that that's what we should, all should be doing. We should. All right. All right. Well, okay. Carol, we're gonna we're gonna see you in Florida. Yeah, party. I told you that. <laughs> all right. Um. Guys, thanks for, for, for joining us. Follow us all on the social medias. You know where to find us. And uh, last words? Um, thanks to all the commenters. And sorry, we can't see even with my fancy new glasses. It's kind of <laughs> far away, the screen. Something about it doesn't work for kids. Okay. Um, but good evening, and thank you for all that. And okay. we'll be doing more of these. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 The best part. Oh, is this, oh. Still, is this still on? Yeah. Hey, are you guys still there watching? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're talking about New York. I just can't uh, stress enough that uh, on Paloma this week, uh, thanks to Nancy and uh, Scott Ross, um, it's they've been having New York week. And just if you found any of this conversation interesting remotely, especially read Armin Rosen's piece. Oh, man. It's phenomenal. It's yeah. so good. I should have pitched this. Palomamedia.com. It's been New York week. We've had some incredible articles, including one yesterday, A Daughter of a New York Hustler by Alex Brooklyn. But today's lead story right there when you get there is by Armin Rosen about about New York under COVID, go read it. Oh, it's yeah. it's, it's definitely going to be the best thing you're going to read today. You got to get him in here to read it too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We'll just get him in here in general. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks guys. Bye.